first started playing for rugby league for Otahu because my father worked in the treasing works. He was uh, in, in the killing house at uh, Southdown. And uh, the, he had been a rugby league player of some note himself. And uh, the uh, local rugby league team, a bloke called George Thorpe, came around and saw him to see if he would coach their teams. And he said, I couldn't do it because I was busy uh, on shift work, but you can have my son. He'll play for you. So that's how I first started playing. And I, th I was around about six years of age. Obviously, he had a a reasonable bit of talent because I got in rep teams right from when I started at about six or seven for Otahu. Yeah, we had we had leather boots and uh, leather boots and leather sprigs. So and we and of course were inspected assiduously by the referee before each game because they were put together with nails and the leather would shrink and the nails would protrude. And of course it was <laughs> it was a bit dangerous, so they they checked you out before you played, and then a, a little bit later, not so much later, they came, went to aluminium sprigs, which were also attached with nails, but in a different manner. I didn't make it till the key was until I was 28, and uh, and I made it by omission rather than by fact because. I wasn't picked in the team. I'd been through all the trials for years and uh, always been prominent, but never ever got the nod, as they say. And uh, when uh, I, I did actually get in the team in 1961, they had picked Gary Phillips and Brian Reedy as the fullbacks. And uh, they, Gary Phillips and Ron Ackland and Neville Denton had asked for some more money uh, because they were dissatisfied with how much they were getting for touring and uh, which in those days was an actual fact nine pound for a single man and uh, 12 pound for a married man with a, a pound for each child so they uh, the New Zealand rugby league didn't muck around with those three blokes they just said sorry if you you'll have to go so they put three new blokes in and I happened to be one of the new blokes so I was on the backup list so I went in as the number to fall back to Brian Reedy, but Brian Reedy never ever played fullback. And uh, so I got in for that tour and to England and France and with a bit of luck I had a, a fairly successful tour. So after that I played over fifty games for New Zealand and had more had more trouble getting out than getting in. It was certainly tough because uh, the team that got the ball tried to hang on to it as long as they possibly could. In those days, the English were the champions of the world, and uh, so they um, uh, <laughs> they had all sorts of tactics of getting the ball off you. One of them was they'd send a man offside if you had the ball. He'd he'd whip offside and bowl somebody over, and they'd immediately give you a penalty. So he'd kick the ball out, and they'd have a scrum, and they won all the scrums. So they got the ball back again. And the secret of winning the game because of the unlimited tackles was to control the ball, and if you had the ball, you could control it, and that's what they did. Where is referee Clay? Yes, all right, it's Great Britain. Great Britain ball. Dick had it. So far, the long range in runs of Huddett and Edgar have not materialized. Fair, and with five minutes gone in the second half, Great Britain eight, New Zealand 14. Each side scored two tries. It's the goals that make the difference. Halfway line. Brian McTighe. And if Great Britain were to lose this test, I can imagine changes for the next test. Dick Hutter to come around. Going away, Dick Hutter. He's got to turn inside if he can, but Brian Lee, whoa. Brian Lee, number 19, is quite a lively boy. And it's a penalty. Terry O'Grady picks it up. It's about the only time he's picked it up this afternoon. And the Aussies played uh, a forward orientated game. They had a lot of good backs. The French just went pretty mad. They'd throw it anywhere. And, um, yeah, no, it wasn't. I don't think it was forward. It was most probably forward dominated, yeah. But they had the backs as well. There were some excellent backs around, like folks like Billy Boston. and. big guy again. There's, they're all wanting a try from Boston. Everybody's wanting a try from Boston. There he goes. Big, fairly Billy Boston. Knocks 
good. But there goes Maddox. Well, he's like a runaway bloody stream train when he, he got going. He was a big bloke. He was 14 and a half stone, which is quite big even by today's standards. And oh, he's dropped it. Ashton. Ashton's got a chance if he can get it out to Boston. Boston's one man to be. Boston's into the corner. Boston's in for, is it? Yes. Billy Boston after Haddett and Ashton had made it. Right in the far corner. There's the scorer. And uh, Billy Boston wants me to tell you that he's only 27 years of age. He doesn't consider that a veteran age. Uh, Billy Boston, with 15 minutes gone, puts England on to the uh, well in with a chance. Let's put it that way at the moment. He was um, a dark fella. He'd p an interesting story about how he got to play league. He was playing rugby in Wales as a schoolboy, and you weren't allowed to sign to be a professional footballer until you were 16. And Cess Mountford, who was a talent scout for Wigan at the time, was sitting at his uh, in his home at his uh, dinner table, waiting until midnight struck to get him to sign. Uh, his uh, professional career at 16, which he did, and he never looked back from then. Murphy inside to Ashton, and I slip pass. Ashton to Boston. Oh, and a great tackle by Fagan with Boston in full stride. That takes some doing. But getting back to his football ability, I think mainly his size and the fact that he ran hard, and he was big, but hard to beat in rugby league, I reckon. Oh, and don't forget his three points for a try and two points for a go. Oh, and what a bump by Bill Boston. And the lad there with a fair one. Uh, I don't think there was anything wrong with that, but if fifth, oh yeah, the referee's having a word with him to our right. To, well, over the top there, there's the, the referee's having a word with Boston. There he is. Uh, well, the referee's always right, and it's a penalty. He had the ball. I, I know he hit him hard, but he had the ball. There's nothing to stop a shoulder charge. However, fortunately, the lad is up. It's Jim Bond, number 12, and that smelling salt will bring any of his missing senses back very quickly. He's about 11 stone. Billy Boston's 15 and a half. No wonder he went down. Ah, he's back again. Uh, nothing that a, a sniff of smelling salts won't put right. Like folks like Billy Boston and Eric Ashton and Alex Murphy, they weren't any slugs, so they would have been big shiners in today's football, no doubt about it. The, the three yard meant that was, has, but you could stand back as far as you like when you had the ball, when you received it, it was only them that had to be back three yards, but yes it was, it was uh, trench warfare. 20 minutes gone, the score two points to Great Britain, none, nil, or out for New Zealand. We're getting a bit of American type rugby there, they tackling the man not in possession, N Snowden, Madsen, and I'm deliberately giving you lots of names at this moment so you can establish them. In some way or another, there's Edwards. And he plays it back to number nine. Number 11 is Hammond with his sweatband on. Save his cauliflower ears. A wide one to Schultz. To... And uh, New Zealand have kept possession far longer than they usually do. Deacon. He's from Waikato. They have an overlap if they can break the break. But they're still trying to go down the middle in the Swinton crowd, which is uh, obviously very much for Great Britain if they can get something to cheer about or having to be content with where they want him. <laughs> New Zealand in uh, black and white, the Kiwis. Emery, Deacon. And I'll give you the tacklers. Now on the Great Britain side, so I can introduce you to them. Charlie Reynolds made the tackle. Holiday number 11 from Cumberland. And the kick and the change. If it bounces right, there's a possibility, but 
He tried to drop it in, but he didn't. So it's a chance. Training was very hard uh, for on, for the Kiwis because they realised the coaches and the older players that had been there before uh, that the one way you could beat them was to be faster and fitter than, than them and who the opposition was. So they used to train us very hard. We trained quite often twice a day, uh, every day of the week, uh, Sundays included if they felt like it and they'd push you to play and we played two to three times a week against English and French teams and uh, so yeah the, the, uh, they got us pretty fit. And look how they're moving it. Second side coming up is it. Tommy Hatfield they're cheering them on. Well tackled Mick Sullivan. He's not in touch. It's still going and it's dropped it and it's a knock on. Well that was as near as matters. Doesn't count of course but this fight back by New Zealand has been a, a feature of their play, a very fit side indeed. Great credit to their coach, Snowy Telford, up at 7 o'clock every morning. And uh, training over the Oakley Moors has certainly been a, a great thing for their fitness. didn't get paid to play uh, as such. We got wages, as I said, uh, in my day in 1961, it was £9 a week for a married man, a single man, sorry. Twelve pound for a married man and a pound for each child you had, so you weren't going to break the bank with that. Yeah. <laughs> Great Britain players are on twenty-five pound for a win. The penalty for aye 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 aye, aye. just uh, males and snow having a little bit of a to do. Great Britain are on twenty-five pound if they win. Ten pound if they lose, uh, but New Zealand the boys are really amateurs. They don't get anything extra for winning or less for losing. Well, Munger Emery would most probably be as hard a case as anybody. There were, were other blokes that were could take it, but uh, Munger knew how to handle himself, and uh, uh, they they treated him with respect too. So they left him alone a little bit, but uh, he was as hard as anybody. It's a scrum down. Manger Emery, there he is, the field side prop. He's got a wonderful hobby, he makes home brew. I bet if they win tonight, he'll be making a lot of it. Scram down again. And the referee play, we can just see. Oh dear. Bond, uh, Roger Bailey, nice one. Castle, Bruce Castle, loose forward, a very light boy, but being brought in, he's in the side because it's uh, rather a dry ground. They're going to play a heavier man. Snowden, got his passing nicely. There's Emery. Oh, and he's got his passing nicely to Bond. And Bond's going away. Nobody's going to catch him. They are. Bolton just caught him. Wonderful run by Bond. And it's New Zealand right in the game now. And uh, Boston must be offside. And uh, referee play agrees. Boston doesn't. <laughs> but uh, it'll be a penalty goal, a penalty shot. I'm rather uh, predicting there from Fagan. Uh, Sam was a different player. Munger was an aggressive player and he would let people know that he was there, generally with a, a nice little clip in the ear or something. But uh, Sam was different. Sam just was resilient. They could hit him all day and knock him over all day and he'd grunt and stand up and play the ball and be ready to run the next time. Whereas uh, Munger would be making people grunt. Up pass. And Sam Edwards nearly lost his fingers, but he's got the ball, which is more important to him. Sam Edwards, one of the Maoris in the team. They call him Sam Bass amongst the boys. They've all got some... Oh, this is a chance. Hey, hey. Blood rushing to his knuckles again. Hey. Come on, man. Come on Sam. <laughs> Well, this is, uh, that was good football, brilliant, taken by 
Roger Bailey and Sa uh, Thomas Mayles looks a bit to the leg, just to our left, and he is. Well, I like to think of Roger Bailey as being the best, most probably a bit biased because he was our club footballer, and but at the time he was 18, and he, he was just absolutely brilliant, and uh, he uh, he had his feet on the ground, which helped a hell of a lot. And I, I think uh, from memory he scored about 18 tries in England in 61. That's a tremendous amount of scores. And I mean, he just, he had everything. He was fast and he used to tackle. And it looks as if Snowden's getting it, he has. So this is a chance. Oh, and it's a good, uh, beautiful move by Cook. A dummy, who's chasing him, he's going on his own. And it's a try. It's a try by Roger Bailey. And a brilliant created effort by Cook, the centre, who damaged uh, the Great Britain middleman who watched him go. He was most probably as good as anybody that I played with. Eddie Moore, number 24, score nine points to seven. Bobby Irvine, 14. I think this boy is going to be a good New Zealand player by next tour. played against McTeague and uh, he was a, a bully boy and, and a good footballer but uh, the, I suppose the most famous was Vince Corralius and he had the uh, face of a like a north end of a southbound bus and uh, he was a pretty hard case and uh, he knew how to do and they they could be uh, you know do their damage uh, and not get caught they were pretty pretty crafty at it, they knew what they were doing. Schultz. He's quite a yachtsman, is Schultz, so the wet ground will suit him there, some boy. And in goes, there goes some boy, he smiles away, uh, used to all this sort of stuff with the referees, having a word with the touch judge, Mr. Heap, who is having a word with Bill Holiday. We'll have a look at this one. Now then, just cut this out, we're not uh, having this sort of stuff said, Mr. Clay. It had really been quite afternoon as Eric, Sergeant Major, weighs 16 stone. He was actually a warrant officer. Pullback Tate, Spud to kick. And it's a good one. That Ridge Gesnier was a good uh, footballer. Raper, Johnny Raper, another good footballer. They were very fast. The hard grounds encouraged them to be fast. I think the Aussies were most... Funnily enough, the, the Englishmen were the fastest. The English uh, were really fast, but they didn't have as many fast players as the Aussies did. Charlie Sealing, father was a great player in one of the early tours, 1907. The name that will ring about with a lot of people. Great Britain will get the ball if the scrum doesn't collapse. Thomas Smales, M Murphy. Martin Schultz, a beautiful move. Burgess, so I'll take him, Burgess. Oh, beautiful try, Burgess. Beautiful try. Beautiful try. Part of the business at the front, and we can now get some football. Reedy, speedy Reedy, leading try scorer in New Zealand Test football. Uh, so he was speedy, really, really speedy? No, he wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't the fast man, Brian. He was relatively fast, but he wasn't. He wasn't a real speed machine. But uh, it sort of goes a bit with Reedy, doesn't it, Speedy? And uh, that's the reason for it, I think. Don't tell him it was me that said that, because he won't like it. We're injured in the first half, but they're back on the field, and it's 13 each. And there it goes, Red uh, Lee looking for support. He's got to go on his own. And it's still, he nearly does. He gets it inside to Edward. Edwards to Cook. Cook to Bailey. And Bailey to Reedy. And Reedy in for a try. And Reedy, the wingers in for a very good try. And the crowd is going quite mad about this. This kind of ball handling by New Zealand. And young Reedy uh, gets a very important try. Amazingly, he would uh, 
he would not make 12 stone ringing wet. And he was, he marked uh, Billy Boston. And I used to have a bit of a joke with him in later years. I used to say to him, I wasn't so much tackling Billy Boston when he arrived at the fullback's berth. It was the fact that he had Speedy Reedy streaming off him, who'd tackled him previously in about 20 yards and uh, was hanging on for grim death. And uh, so I had to tackle Billy Boston and Brian Reedy. He denied it, of course. Tommy, Tommy didn't know when to give in. If it was a, a wall in front of him and you asked him to run through it or told him to run through it, he'd run through it. And uh, he had a side... Bill, uh, yeah, Brian Reedy was a, a more tricky player. He had side steps and things like that. But, uh, yeah, Tommy was as good as any winger I ever saw. In my opinion, he was good. Tenacious, didn't know when to give up. Yeah, good value. And the crowd roar. And up they go. This is the sort of thing the crowd loves. And it could be a try for New Zealand. A bit try. Yes, yes, we can get the ball across Sergio Bailey. We're right bang on time. And New Zealand are right bang on the Great Britain line. Move it across. And they're in for a try, I think. Tommy Hatfield's in for a try. And Tommy Hatfield, what a finish to a, a very, very excellent match. A very good try by Tommy Hatfield, and I'm glad they heard me about that. Don was relentless. He was a, a tackler, a low tackler, never tackled high. And he tack the front-on tackles he made low were incredible. I remember playing at uh, Oddsall Stadium once and I can remember uh, seeing Don Hammond. I saw this Turner uh, start to run. Turner was the captain of the English team. He was a front row forward. He started to run with the ball and he ran. Uh, and Don, <laughs> I thought I'm going to have to tackle him. And Don stepped in front of him and, and hit him just above the, the knees, front-on and sort of half lifted him and carried him back about five yards and a look of amazement on the skipper's face was amazing and it and Don Don was not very big but he had started in the backs but he was uh, he was relentless tireless and uh, just a good all-round Kiwi forward number two Rigglesworth it's got to be a long one Hammond he'll have to go on his own and look it's still going well, he's a pretty good forward. Number 11, Hammond, you pick out the best player of the match. He's <laughs> exercising. Hammond, 25 minutes gone. This is the boy, but he'll not be fast enough to run. He had no speed. Him and Mel Cook. Mel Cook was the other fellow. that He was our captain too in later years, and he, uh, I mean, he was a marvellous bloke. Sam Edwards, a bushman from Auckland, right on the halfway line. Malco, oh, he's going he's to judge. And which way do you want him? Under or over the line? And uh, and and the tackler, the tackler is getting penalised. There's referee Eric Clay, and uh, no doubt for picking his legs up, he couldn't help it, did he? Well, ball loose. Oh, but, and, and it's Cook, Cook, Cook's a chance for a try, oh, he slipped, oh, he's up, he's up, he's in, he's in, Mel Cook, the vice-captain of the side, two, two goes at it, but he got it in the end, well, there's Mel Cook, a happy lad without his teeth, but a happy lad, and one of the successors of this tour, no wonder he's blowing, harder than climbing post scoring tries, I should think, but that's, Opposition. Well done, Cook, and it takes New Zealand past the 20 mark, 22 points to 11. Well, John Fagan, the fullback, goal kicker. John is uh, very interested in golf, hence his uh, precision planting of the ball. And uh, very slow walk back. Look how slowly he walks. He picks his legs up. There's a touch line. He's over the touch line. He's out of play now. He's back into play. And it's a very, very good goal indeed. 
Well, there's the kicker who's been a very successful goal kicker this afternoon, John Fagan. 21, 21 minutes left for play. Yeah, their defensive work was most probably the strong point. They were just, uh, they just didn't, didn't ever give up, you know, and uh, and they backed up. They were tireless in backing up. The Aussies can teach us a lesson there, like when the Aussies made a break, there was always a man or two inside and outside. They had when we made a break, especially oh, Roger Bailey, everybody would be going, go Roger, and standing and clapping him. But uh, you know, you really want to uh, have good, good support. Well, we make it, we make it time, and uh, Fagan could regain the lead with the last kick of the first half for Thomas Mayles putting the ball into his own forward's feet. Uh, I should imagine Kennedy, who's a crafty man, is with the ball. He'll make sure he's going to kick a goal. He can kick the goal. He, I, when I mean he can kick it, I mean that, that he, time doesn't matter. He's entitled to take what time he wants. And it, it, we might look at this fellow because it takes an awful long time to to take in a shot. He makes a great lot of um, effort. Good goal kicker. In fact, somebody once said they could sing a chorus of walking through the Black Forest while he took a kick. Now, I don't know, you try it. You can do something there. It'll take a long time. He's on the second line already. Steady. Steady, doesn't hurry. Walk very, very slowly. Walk very slowly, very slowly. We could do a refrain. Then he gets up, brings his leg up, whoop. And he's missed it. He's missed it, but Cows have decided to let it go. The museum, funnily enough, started off with a bloke called Trevor Berry. And Trevor's wife, after Trevor died, and Trevor used to play golf with me, we were mates, and uh, she had a couple of boxes of his material because he used to write in the programme and he used to write on his uh, newspapers and he used to do a bit of broadcasting and he'd collected memorabilia and she said, would you like to have a look at it and see what, what we can do with it, that Rex Kiwis might want it or something like that. So I picked it up and there were two boxes and one of the things that, was in it was a 1911 photograph of the New Zealand Kiwis and uh, it was autographed and uh, it sort of st struck a chord with me. I don't know why, but uh, I thought it was marvellous. And uh, so I had to look through the other stuff and sorted out a few things. And I thought, you know, we ought to have an archive of some sort for this stuff because there isn't any that I knew of. So I became interested in that and uh, I got uh, some of the fellas that I'd been at coaching at university to help me, folks like Bill Bates and Brian Keane and also players and people that I knew. I was on the judicial with Ray Heffenden, I knew him and Don Hammond and so about eight or ten of us eventually ended up um, raising money and through trusts and things like that and we, we started sorting out all this stuff and once we started asking for it it came from everywhere and uh, if you ever get a chance and I don't know whether you have been or not to the museum you'll see that it, it is a marvellous institution just because of the fact that it's an archive and a museum it keeps all that stuff which would have been thrown away and uh, everybody even if they're not rugby league people are interested. I, th I think it's, uh, it's worth a look and uh, it's got some really, really fantastic stuff in it, which is the same as all museums. And if you're a rugby league person, then it's all the more interesting because you find out things you never knew. Ten minutes left, and it's uh, Great Britain behind by 13 points. Boston on the burst. Boston on the burst, and that's something. Well tackled to Fagan. This boy Fagan had a very good game indeed. Not the fastest of men, but he's a pretty safe tackler. It's a long one. New Zealand are covering. Ashton's going on his own inside to Hallis. Can Hallis come off it? Oh, and another tackle by Fagan. The, the biggest thing I got out of rugby league was friends. You know, um, we've always had the name of uh, being a working class game, and I suppose that's true. But what that has got to do with anything, I, I wouldn't have a clue. But I coached university and 
later life and they were a pretty good bunch of blokes and you wouldn't put them in the working class category, I wouldn't have thought. But um, there, were, there were good boys and good men and uh, they were loyal, most of them. And if you weren't, you soon got reminded about it by the mafia. They soon sorted you out and uh, told you had to do things in a proper way. You were always looked after your mates. And I, but I think it was symptomatic of the social issues at that time and how life worked. Like the, when there was uh, a party and we always had, we had dances on a Saturday night at the club rooms. They looked after the blokes that over imbibed. They looked after the guys that got into a bit of a fight. They'd always stop them and then they'd let them know about it. But on the Tuesday at training, they'd say, that is not acceptable behaviour. And uh, they, and I thought that, and I learnt a lot of my social skills at rugby league. And uh, I think they're, they're generally genuine. Way against him. If I'd have been Tommy there, I'd have switched Murphy to scrum, just give him a rest for a few minutes. So is this the equaliser? Nine seven Great Britain. Fagan. Jack Fagan is pretty pretty close. You can just have a look at the the angle of it. Some of the tallest rugby posts in the business. There's is this the equalizer? Jack Fagan, who missed the first now chance of not winning the series, but a chance of getting a draw and not being completely defeated in three, but still plenty of time to go. Now well, that's a lovely action picture of how Pagan does it. Nine seven, remember. Nine and nine. Well, I don't know whether it's uh, sympathy or what, but there's quite a lot of uh, spectators behind me at any rate, not wearing Kiwi jacket, but they were cheering for the Kiwis, and they're not all players, too. Must think that's very good pronunciation. That is the chance for Bailey. What a beautiful excellent. Still going, still going, and there's bags of room on the left. If they get it away quickly, there isn't an Englishman in sight. He's come the wrong way. But he's not, he's got it in Ayaz. Oh, can he go the length of the field? Can stop it, go the length of the field. He's, oh, a brilliant tackle. A brilliant tackle by Fagan. I thought Stockwell would be behind the post. But what a football, both side movement. He, he, he sort of picks his legs up slowly, very, very slowly. I don't I once uh, found I could sing a, a little song whilst he went on, but he kicks, and he kicks the goal, and it's six points to four, and there's Jack Fagan, great man in New Zealand rugby league football.